Good afternoon. As a teacher and a former archaeologist, I certainly am a person who believes in the power of teaching, in the power of history, and the power of cultural training. I'd like to introduce you first to my favorite teacher, my father. He was um, a very talented gentleman, a very influential person to me, my siblings, my children, and everyone who knew him. He spoke four languages. He was a world-class athlete. He was a great ballroom dancer well into his 80s. He was a great singer, and he left a legacy of tolerance, kindness, and the power of being a good person. And I think his legacy will live on for many generations. I'd like to also introduce you to my father, who was drafted into World War II and served as a messenger uh, on the Russian front in one of the most horrific, terrible periods of American uh, world history. And all the chaos of a government led by psychopaths who taught all the opposite that he believed. Intolerance, racial hatred, religious hatred, and bad science and stereotyping. This is the power of both good and bad teaching. My own personal experience in a more calm way than, of course, World War II, and taught me about the power of teaching was when I was only four years old, one of my earliest memories and one of my most important ones. We immigrated to the US on a boat, so yes, I was a fob, and my mother was bringing us to the wilds of Texas from southern Germany. And of course, Texas, guns, gators, and snakes, oh my, was terrifying to her, and she, if there are no poisonous snakes in southern Germany where she was from, so she was deathly afraid that her young boy would find snakes and pick them up and decide that they were fun play to toys. So I remember vividly on the boat, she sat me down and said, and calmly and very sternly, as a German mother might do, uh, to watch out for snakes. Be careful of them and don't pick them up. And furthermore, snakes notice movement and they are faster than you are. Of course, this is a terrifying scenario for a young four-year-old, so I was listening very raptly. And she said, the thing to do when you see a snake is to stand perfectly still and wait until that snake and that rascal leaves and call for help. And then mama will come and papa will come rescue you. Yeah, mama, I can play and understand the orders. I will do what you want. So of course, later that summer, my mother was visiting with lady friends that afternoon, having tea or some such in the front of the house and I was in the backyard playing. When after a while, blood-curdling screams came forward, snake, snake, and so all the ladies came to rescue the little German boy, and there I am in the backyard, having stood there probably 20 minutes in the blazing Texas sun, coming close to sunstroke like this, exactly as Mama had said. And instead of rescuing me, all the ladies started laughing because a box turtle had entered the backyard <laughs> and had slowly crawled across the yard while I stood raptly waiting for that terrifying reptile to kill me. She had never explained the right way and taught me what a snake looked like, and I'm a visual learner. <laughs> Teaching is an incredibly powerful tool, and it lasts a lifetime in my case, and certainly with my father, his influence to his children, grandchildren, and everyone who knew him will last for many, many years on. It turns out that there's some research about Homo sapiens and our cultures that show us that this kind of teaching over long periods of time is one of our most astounding and important features that makes us a successful species, longevity. There is a psychology t-shirt that says, oft, and I've seen it, maybe you have too, that says, nature or nurture, it's still my parents' fault. I would like to add to that, nurture, it's probably my grandparents' fault too. It turns out that research by people like Dr. Rachel Kaspari of Central Michigan University, who did a lengthy study on lifespans of early humans, 
early Homo sapiens and our cousins, the Neanderthals, showed that there's a distinct difference in longevity and parenting and grandparenting between groups like Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Neanderthals rarely lived past the age of 30, whereas Homo sapiens, modern people, culturally have developed for a long period of time with grandparents. And this may be one of the keys to our development as a successful species because the transmission of art, complex languages, communication skills, technology may be critically developed by longer periods of training between parents, children, grandparents, and even great-grandparents. And this has been a long millennial pattern with people. It, I would like to illustrate a little bit of this and show that not only is this parenting, grandparenting, and legacy of training between generations a critical feature for us, but also it teaches us how closely related we really are, how short our history really is, and how we impact each other more than we might suspect. This, of course, is a simple slide, but I'd like to just pretend that that's you or your generation. So to the left would be then your parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, your children if you have any or will have them, and so on. It's a little uh, enlightening to me or maybe even frightening to understand that of all the millennials of generations that we've had, I personally will know very few of them. In fact, I know only a couple or knew a couple of my grandparents certainly my parents, I have children. Someday we hope, Meg and I, that they will have children and we will know them. But beyond that, I will know of these people, I won't know them. But their influence and my influence on the future can be very lasting and powerful, as we all know. I would like to suggest that we look at history and this pattern not in dates and not in generations of 20 years or so, which we, when we replicate ourselves, but more about our cultural legacy and our longevity legacy. And I'd like to suggest about a 60-year time period instead of a 20-year time period. By this, I mean 70-year-old grandparents. And in the past, many times we have records of people being 70 and 80 years old. Not as many as today, but certainly they were present. Then influencing children and grandchildren. So at a 60-year time period, we have a 70-year-old training a 10-year-old. I picked 10 arbitrarily as an age where those children and grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren, were beginning to fully understand what they were being taught. And if we look at that, well, then we can begin to see how compact modern human history really is. This is an illustration going back in time in the, say, let's pick the United States. If this is 2010, then this generation, of course, is the parents. And if we take that 60-year time period, this was a generation that grew up in the 1950s. Well, who influenced them? We go back already to the 1890s, the 1830s, the 1760s. So if we look at legacy of cultural traditions, what we have is we are back at the American Revolution. Four life legacies separate us. And all the history, the two wars, the computer age, the space age, flight, the development of the West, the Civil War, there it is in an com incredibly compact time period. So we are very much more related to each other than we think. Or we are more closely connected to each other than we are than we think or we make ourselves aware. It becomes a little more uh, clear if we go a little bit further back in time. Here again, whoops, my pardon. Now we have 2010, the American Revolution. This is Columbus. So we are separated culturally from Columbus by just this many generations of legacy and tradition that is being passed on to each other. Again, we have 
the American Revolution, Columbus, this is then the Black Death. And so the modern world can be seen in just these 18 or so legacies. And this, I think, will illustrate very quickly that we have a very recent past and we, have, we are much more connected to each other than we believe or that we think about. This is then going back further, obviously, but how quickly we get to this point. This is the life of Muhammad in AD 600. So this is the legacy, the traditions being passed on every 60 years or so of all the entire Middle Age time period leading up to the modern development of Western Europe, well, as Western Europeans headed to the Western Hemisphere. Here we have, going back to from the time of Muhammad and the spread of Islam throughout the Middle East and all the influences it had then later on Europe, we go back to this person 33 lifespans ago, which is the rise of Augustus in Rome. And his contemporary uh, in the Middle East, whom the Greeks named Jesus. So if we think of ourselves as a long tradition and great divisions, if you start looking at grandparents and their influence every 60 years and each generation influencing the previous one, we are 33 lifespans separated from the time of Christ. And this is all of AD periods then. This is about AD, AD 30. So this is all of the New World or modern uh, times. This is um, a summary of 75 lifespans, if you will. This again would be Caesar, Augustus, and contemporary Jesus and others of the Roman era. This would then be the entire Roman Empire, and this is then again the life of Muhammad in AD 60. So this would be the entire Roman Empire in this area right here. Um, th this is then the Greek city-states and the development of early democratic theories. Here we go back to the development of the Great Wall of China, the first building of the Great Wall of China in BC times. And then 75 years ago, 75 lifespans ago, is then the very beginning of our discussion of what we consider modern civilization, which is the development of the pyramids in Egypt. So if we want to look at the development of modern agriculture and all of the what we call civilized man, 75 lifespans. And I think, to myself at least, I was a bit surprised at how compact our modern times really are. If the pyramids at Giza were built about 75 lifespans ago, the, life, the last ice age ended about 200 lifespans ago, which is a longer number, but still to me, a very, very compressed time period. The Neanderthals died out about 533 lifespans ago. Again, um, I, I was stunned at the number myself. And then we have pretty good DNA evidence that we were all culturally pretty much unified less than 700 or about 700 lifespans ago. We also know from DNA evidence that there was a probable genetic pinch point about 70,000 BC where we believe, or at least genetic evidence indicates, that all of us were related to between 1,000 and 10,000 families. And there is some discussion as to whether or not that was due to a volcanic eruption in Southeast Asia that caused a series of uh, uh, growing catastrophes and long winters that knocked down a lot of the human population. Some scientists have other discussions of what that might have been, but at least we know that we are a unified people or we are very closely related people. All of this, including the 200,000 years of Homo sapiens, is about 0.0005% of the age of planet Earth. We are a very recent and closely related phenomenon. We can look into the future a little bit too and get some funny numbers. This is, let's say, the 20-somethings in the room here, you, your future children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-grandchildren. With longer lives, it is very possible that you will know these people and your lasting influence, of course, will be 
brought forth to them. If I posit that we live a little longer and now 80 year olds, maybe even 90 year olds are training 10 year olds culturally, then what we have in just this slide with these five figures and five lifespans, if you will, this is the year 2300 and the influence of it. If we go even further, 75 lifespans into the future, we take the same amount of time from the Giza pyramids to today and move into the forward, then using the 70 year marker instead of 60 years, we are now at AD 72, 60. It's not that far away and we are not that different. Our vast and ancient differences, they're not so vast and we're not very different. Our legacy is powerful. Let's continue to make it a good one. Thank you.